The National Basketball Association is by far the most popular basketball league in the world, and thus has some world-class arenas. Incredibly, only one of them was built before 1990. So anyway, let's just get straight into it. Here are the NBA arenas for 2021-22. State Farm Arena, home of the Atlanta Hawks. It's located right next door to one of the best football stadiums in the world, but it doesn't make quite the same impression from the outside. I do quite like that layered roof design though. Also, look, it says Atlanta, and that's the city that it's in. On the inside, you can really tell it was renovated just a few years ago, this huge video board being the most obvious addition. TD Garden, home of the Boston Celtics. In terms of the exterior, the TD Garden is lacking. Compared to the last one, it really doesn't have much going for it. It's a bit box-like, perhaps out of necessity. But the interior is a little more distinctive. That old school parquet floor in particular sets it apart. Green seats would have been great, but they do share the arena with the black and gold Bruins. So the recently installed black seats will do just fine. Barclays Center, home of the Brooklyn Nets. Well, this one is basically the opposite of the last one. The exterior looks incredible. I love the almost rusty look that is meant to evoke the brownstone buildings in Brooklyn. But it should be impressive when it costs a whopping one billion dollars. That's expensive for a football stadium, let alone an indoor arena. Oh, maybe it's not quite the opposite of the last one. The inside is somewhat similar. Black seats and not quite a parquet court, more of a herringbone. Spectrum Center, home of the Charlotte Hornets, who are part owned by Michael Jordan, the famous baseball player. You might be thinking, why does a baseball player own a basketball team? But he did actually play basketball for a little while before and after his minor league baseball career. Not a lot of people know that. Anyway, I like the mix of metallic cladding and brickwork on the facade. As for the interior, well, there's a real buzz about the place. Even when it's not a hive of activity, it's still the bee's knees. Ah, damn it, that last one doesn't work, does it? United Center, home of the Chicago Bulls, the team that MJ played for, but you probably already knew that. He has actually played at this arena as well, not as a bull, but as a Washington Wizard. The exterior design is a little dull compared to what we've seen so far, but what it does have going for it is the capacity. It's the biggest arena in the league. Although to be fair, there's not a huge difference between the biggest and smallest. Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, home of the Cleveland Cavaliers. It's the only arena in the league with a Karen haircut. Yeah, it's not a perfect replica, but they did the best they could. It has actually undergone some recent renovations that have changed the appearance of the facade. As you can see, they've basically just extended the building. A lot of NBA arenas have an impressive scoreboard, but I just like this one's name, Humongatron is presumably named after Percival Humungatron, one of Cleveland's founders. American Airlines Center, home of the Dallas Mavericks. This one has a facade that would look at home on a college football stadium. Very impressive. But up top, it's more like an airplane hangar, hence its nickname, The Hangar. It has an appropriate sponsor, come to think of it. In contrast to the atypical exterior, the interior is fairly standard, but there's always going to be less room to be creative on the inside. Ball Arena, home of the Denver Nuggets. You might be thinking, what's with the name? But a Denver Nugget is simply a Denver omelette in nugget form. Oh, and the name Ball Arena. Well, Ball Corporation is a Colorado-based company that mainly deals with packages. It's around one mile above sea level, making it the highest NBA arena, meaning thinner air, which does still have an effect even for an indoor sport like basketball. It just makes it that little bit more difficult for the away team. 
Not so much for the Utah Jazz, who are also quite high up. Little Caesars Arena, home of the Detroit Pistons. This flashy venue was built just a few years ago to replace the Palace of Malice at the Palace fame. The outside is fine, but even better is the interior, which is done up in this strikingly vibrant shade of red. Fortunately, the NHL team that shares the arena also have red on their uniform, as you'd expect given that they're called the Red Wings. Another visually striking feature is the ceiling that can light up different colors. It gives it a real sci-fi vibe, as well as the cube-like video board. There are even more unique features I can mention, but we haven't got all day. I really like this one. Chase Center, home of the Golden State Warriors. It's the newest arena in the NBA, having opened in 2019. The Warriors moved out of their Oakland residence to San Francisco. Poor Oakland, all that's left now are the A's, and even their future in Oakland is in doubt. Just like their baseball counterparts, the arena is located right on the water's edge. Although, that's really more of a bonus for a baseball team than a basketball team. You can't really tell from the inside. I know that I shouldn't count food as a feature of the stadium because it can change from month to month, but I hear that the curry here is the best in the world. Much better than the curry in Philadelphia. Toyota Center, home of the Houston Rockets. For the most part, the exterior is nothing to write home about. But the grand front entrance does look like you're walking into a rather extravagant Toyota dealership. Which is no bad thing. Yeah, it's not quite a Lexus dealership, but Lexus don't make pickup trucks, and this is Texas. Wait, what? I guess I was wrong. Anyway, uh, I have completely lost my train of thought. Uh, uh, Houston, Houston, we don't have a problem with this arena. It is nice. Bankers Life Fieldhouse, home of the Indiana Pacers. This one's reminiscent of many college basketball arenas with its arched roof and brick facade. This was actually an intentional homage, as was the nearby Lucas Oil Stadium's design, which matches the arena perfectly. And it even has those huge windows that let in plenty of light, but they don't quite offer the same views of Indianapolis as Lucas Oil Stadium does, as you might expect. But regardless, it's an excellent arena and quite unique. Staples Center, home of the Los Angeles Clippers and the Los Angeles Lakers. It's the only arena in the NBA that's shared by two teams. It's known as the house that Kobe built because it was built just a couple of years after the late Kobe Bryant joined the Lakers. They didn't have to wait long to see success. A year after it opened, they were champions. Then the next year. And then the year after that. In fact, since it's opened, the Staples Center has seen six championships. It goes without saying that none of them were won by the Clippers. Maybe that's why they're planning on building their own arena. FedEx Forum, home of the Memphis Grizzlies. The name does sound like the world's most boring online chat room. Did you see the new boxes that FedEx has introduced? So sturdy. Unlike most arenas built in the 21st century, it's a big round dome. A design that was more common back in the day, but with a bit of a modern touch. Oh, and interestingly, despite the name, there are no wild grizzlies in Tennessee. I guess they are named after the few that are kept in captivity. Or, given that this is the NBA, maybe they moved from an area that did have grizzly bears. Vancouver, perhaps? Seriously, it seems that half the league were once located elsewhere. FTX Arena, home of Miami Heat. Can you guess which company used to sponsor the arena? This is one of my favorite exteriors so far. It's very modern, very sleek, and you know what? When approaching from this angle, it looks exactly like what Elon Musk's house would be if he was an evil villain. The spaceship would come out of this building, Thunderbird style. I can't say that I like the interior as much as I like the outside, but it is more than adequate.
FISO Forum. I knew it. They only use the term forum for alliteration purposes. It's home of the Milwaukee Bucks, the reigning champs. We've got like a Russian doll situation with three arenas in a row progressively getting smaller. Except this one was actually demolished in 2019. It was the Bucks' former home. Their new home has quite a conservative design. It keeps a low profile, but it does look pretty good with that swooping roof. It basically looks like they got the floor from TD Garden and turned it into a roof. The interior looks fantastic, very clean and modern as you might expect. It's just three years old. Target Center, home of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Interestingly, the adjacent baseball stadium is called Target Field. Target is from Minneapolis. Fancy naming your city after a small piece of fruit. Anyway, back to it. I'm glad they didn't put a giant sponsors logo on the roof like many we've seen so far. A giant target would make it far too easy for the Chinese military if a general manager of the Timberwolves were to tweet his or her support for democracy in Hong Kong. For some reason this one looks a lot smaller on the inside than most NBA arenas. Maybe it's the fact that there isn't like 10 tiers of seating, just two. Smoothie King Center, home of the New Orleans Pelicans. There is an arena in New Orleans, and it's named for the Smoothie King. He destroys his enemies by blending them, then puts them in your drink. But whether you agree with the cruel tactics of the Smoothie King or not, his arena is okay. But it pales in comparison to the mighty Superdome next door. In fact, this one actually is the smallest NBA arena. Despite this, it is still clearly fit for a king. Madison Square Garden, home of the New York Knicks. From the smallest arena to the oldest arena. Don't be fooled, it's not square shaped at all. And it's not really a garden either. Is it even Madison? Well, that's yet to be determined. An arena sized block of land is hard to come by in Manhattan, Central Park excluded. So they just built it on top of a railway station. Something else that's mind blowing is that when the arena was renovated about a decade ago, it cost over a billion dollars. For a renovation, that's crazy. Was it worth it? Well, probably, it's not just a sports venue, but also one of the busiest concert venues in the world. Despite all the money that went into it, it still has a bit of an old school look to it. Which is nice. Paycom Center, home of the Oklahoma City Thunder. Interestingly, this arena was built without an NBA team or NHL team in the city. They had a minor league hockey team and an arena football league development team, but they still built it to the minimum NBA standards in the hope that they might get their own team someday. And guess what? They, they, they did. In many ways, it's the opposite of Madison Square Garden. It lacks the same luxuries, there seems to be plenty of vacant land around, and it's a little more square shaped. Amway Center, home of Orlando Magic. It also hosts an arena football team called the Orlando Predators. Which, if you live in the area, you would already know about that, because they had to knock on your front door and inform you that they moved into the neighborhood. The metal and glass facade looks pretty good, but the interior is where this arena shines. Often teams brag about having the biggest video screen in the world, or the state, or the county. But this one isn't necessarily the biggest, but it is the tallest in the NBA. And much like Boston, they've gone with the parquet floor. Wells Fargo Center, home of the Philadelphia 76ers. Is this the only place in the world that has an NFL and MLB stadium, as well as an NBA slash NHL arena, all within the same parking lot more or less? I know Detroit had all three pretty close together, but this is something else. It might not be my absolute favorite arena, but it does have one thing that the other NBA arenas presumably don't have, and that's 4 and 20 pies for sale. 
This tasty treat originates from the same state as Ben Simmons. Oh. Actually, you know what? Maybe they won't sell them this season. Footprint Center, home of the Phoenix Suns. Fresh off a major renovation and a minor devastation having lost to the Bucks in the finals. But they were basement dwellers a few seasons ago, so I think they'll take that. The best thing about the recent renovation is probably the huge 360 degree video screen. But by far the worst thing about it is they got rid of the purple seats and replaced them with black ones. Or maybe it's more of a charcoal, but that doesn't matter. What's wrong with purple? It's a great color. Motor Center, home of the Portland Trailblazers. It was formerly known as the Rose Garden, Portland being not just Rip City, but also the Rose City. But unlike a typical Rose Garden, it is considered by many to be quite an ugly building. And while I agree it's perhaps not postcard worthy, I think that's a little harsh to call it ugly. The interior looks great with those red and black seats, and the court itself looks even better. I quite like the Blazers logo, as does Damian Lillard who has a fondness for shooting ridiculous threes from it. Golden One Center, home of the Sacramento Kings. The roof features branding of the Golden One and panels collecting rays from the Golden Sun, which is always good. It has quite a nice metallic facade, which thankfully isn't a golden one. And so it doesn't look out of place from street level. Unfortunately, on the inside it loses purple points. They've decided to go with black seats once again despite being a purple team. Whatever. I guess there's plenty of purple on the court. It's one of the few NBA arenas that has a single tier of seating at one end. It looks great though. AT&T Center, home of the San Antonio Spurs. It's a major downsize from their old home, the Alamo Dome, a football stadium. It too has a fairly understated design, with its use of brick and corrugated iron. As for the inside, well, don't get me wrong, when I said Sacramento should have had purple seats, that was nothing against black, because this looks badass. And it obviously matches the Spurs uniform. Scotiabank Arena, home of the Toronto Raptors. This one looks like it's been surrounded by bullies. The much bigger skyscrapers are always picking on Little Scotia. And the CN Tower just watches on. Just like the Spurs, the Raptors used to play out of an actual stadium. This time it was the Sky Dome, home of the Blue Jays. That was just while this arena was being built. Oh, and I guess I should mention that it's apparently the most photographed place in Canada. Vivint Arena, home of the Utah Jazz. It's one of the oldest NBA arenas, although you wouldn't really be able to tell just by looking at it. In its 30 odd years, it's even hosted events at the Winter Olympics. Today, very little ice remains. Ironically, it doesn't even host an ice hockey team, as many others in this league do. It's known for being a very difficult arena for visiting teams. Not just the elevation, but the hostile crowd which you probably wouldn't expect from a team called Jazz. Capital One Arena, home of the Washington Wizards. In a serendipitous turn of events, the sponsor's name comes in handy. In case you were wondering whether the team represents the state of Washington or the US Capitol, it's the Capital One. Another reason you can tell it's in the capital city is that, as you may have noticed, there's no 3D imaging available for security reasons. At least it is actually in DC, unlike the NFL stadium. But yeah, it's a fairly typical NBA arena. And that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching, have a good one.